Hello, everyone. Um, so as Stu mentioned, I'm Sarah. And until recently, I was studying theology at Cambridge, and I've just graduated. So I have been released into the real world. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, and I'm slowly adjusting to it. But I'm back in Cambridge um, to preach about Jonah, which is an amazing story. Um, and probably one that you have heard. So let's begin. Um, so as a child growing up in church, I feel like there are a few stock Bible stories that form part of the Sunday school canon. They're basically a kid's worker's dream. They're full of drama and suspense, and there's normally a main character and an evil villain, and they've got a clear moral lesson. So I'm thinking of David beats Goliath, or Samson and Delilah, or maybe you've heard of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or as we say in kids' church, Shad, Mish, and Abed, um, that trio who defied the king's command to worship an idol and got thrown into a furnace for their allegiance to God. These are the passages that make really good action songs, um, plays for kids to act out, or best of all, good crafts. And I think another such story is the one we've heard today, Jonah and the whale, or maybe you heard Jonah and the fish, Jonah and the giant fish. Um, but to be honest, the exact taxonomy of the sea creature who swallows Jonah isn't really the main point of the story. It seemed that each time I heard the story of Jonah, it always had one moral lesson. There was something to draw out from this account, a precept that teachers would keep returning to again and again. Sometimes God calls us to do really big and important things, like Jonah was called to preach to Nineveh. But we get scared, and we deceive ourselves into thinking we can run far away, that we never have to confront the call of God on our lives. But we can't run from God. He pursues us, we recognize his greatness, we repent, and finally, we act in obedience to his command. Obviously, we don't all become lunch for a giant fish, but we have that moment of realization that we can't hide from the Almighty. And because of our obedience, other people come to know God too. And for me, for a long time, Jonah was just a scriptural metaphor that showed us why it's bad to run away from God. But what I didn't realize was that Jonah was so much more than this. I was beginning to understand that the scriptures aren't just fairy tales with a single message. They are, in the famous words of Shrek, like onions, onions with many layers. And you can peel away each resonance, each reference, and still you might never get to the bottom of God's true and beautiful word. So, sure, at one level, Jonah does warn us of the impossibility of running away from God. But as I read it, and as I began to read from others who had read it more than me, it became clear that this was not the only thing going on. Jonah runs away, yes, but the reason why seems even more significant than the fact that he does so. And I think it's working out why Jonah runs away from Nineveh and why God decides to save the Ninevite people, that we can unlock the relevance of this story for our lives today. He runs away not because he's afraid of being rejected by the Ninevites or because he thinks he lacks the prophetic skills for the mission or even because the task seems too big. He runs away precisely because he knows that his message to the Nineveh will work the people will repent, God will relent, and he cannot handle the fact that God's love is so wide that he would have mercy on that city. He's afraid that a people who to him are unworthy of salvation will indeed be saved. But that's the thing about mercy. It's mercy precisely because we are unworthy. If we deserved it, then we wouldn't even need it in the first place. So I think Jonah is asking us two main questions. Can we handle God's love? 
and can we imitate God's love? And it exposes where our own prejudices and assumptions of who should be saved, of how God should act, are in opposition to the extent of God's mercy. A mercy so wide it boggles the mind. But before we get into the story, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for the gift of your word. I pray today that you would open our eyes so that we may see wonderful, amazing things in your law. I pray that you would soften our hearts to receive the message that you have for us today. And I pray that you would also strengthen our hands so that we might put into practice the commands that you give us. In King Jesus' precious name, I pray. Amen. Okay, so Jonah. Um, And now if you want to turn to the pages you have in front of you, you'll see a summary of Jonah in a really cool (laughs) cartoony format that the Bible Project has done. And I'll loosely be following that as I go through Jonah, so please feel free to use. Um, Jonah is a particularly interesting book in the Old Testament because unlike other prophetic writings, it's not so much the words of a prophet we're hearing as a story about the prophet himself. So not unusually, the first thing that happens to our prophet is that God speaks to him. And in the very first verse, we learn that the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. So here are a clear set of instructions from the Lord to Jonah, telling him exactly what to do, where to do it, but he runs away. Isn't that typical? I know I've had moments where I've needed to make really big decisions, and I've been crying out to God for guidance in the midst of a particular situation I just, I just want instruction. I want the audible voice of God to tell me exactly which way to go. And we think that the voice will give us clarity. But actually, God's voice sometimes doesn't always tell us what we want to hear. And we want advice, but we don't want to do what we're told. Maybe it's just me because I've graduated recently and I've gone back home and I don't have a job. <laughs> and... I feel like when I'm about to do something, because I feel like I'm in a serving mood, I'm going to wash the dishes, I'm going to take the bin out, and then someone tells me to do that thing, and immediately I do not want to do it. I was about to do it a second ago, but now, just because you've told me, I'm not going to do it. Um, The word of the Lord came to me, and I ran away as fast as I could. Um, But for Jonah, it's not even as if he had set out to go to Nineveh, and then God commands him, and he doesn't want to go. As soon as he is commissioned... He's on a mission not to do what he is told. And so this is our introduction to the unwilling prophet. God tells him to go to Nineveh, and he ups and boards a ship to Tarshish as far away from Nineveh as he can possibly get. He's attempting to flee the presence of God, but his presence on the ship causes more trouble. Fast asleep, Beneath the cabin, Jonah is oblivious to the storm raging around him. Waves crash against the ship. The sailors are in turmoil. The end is in sight. I'm quite a visual learner, so I can imagine Jonah in my mind's eye watching the sailors cast lots to see who is to blame for this treacherous journey and knowing that it will land on him. And maybe that's why when it does fall to him, he doesn't rage against the role of the die. He doesn't deny its decision. He simply declares what he has known all along, but has hoped to outrun. He says, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. The sailors, who are pagans, unbelievers, even they recognize the magnitude of this. Yahweh is the God of Israel, the creator of the ends of the earth, inescapable. There is no way they can sail away from a God who created the sea. And so, even though they're reluctant to get rid of him, they try to escape the storm, they do the only thing they think will appease this God. Throw Jonah overboard, 
And ironically, it's the Gentile sailors who cry out to God and Jonah, God's prophet, who ignores him. But then abruptly, incredibly, a large fish emerges from the depths of the sea and swallows Jonah whole. If, if this isn't evidence that God has a sense of humor, then I don't know what is. And as he's sitting in the belly of the fish, he does the only thing that anybody might, who finds himself fully conscious and sitting in a whale's stomach. He prays. In my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help and you listened to my cry. He describes being cast into the deep, surrounded by a flood, feeling like he has been driven away from God's sight and unable to gaze on the Lord's temple. But he concludes his prayer by acknowledging that those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. Salvation comes from the Lord. And like a punctuation point to his prayer, the cherry on top, the fish vomits him out onto dry land. And something about that encounter with God and the fish changes Jonah. The word of the Lord comes to him again, and suddenly he goes. The book tells us that it takes three days to walk the length of Nineveh, but even after just one day, the entire city responds to his concise and rather terrifying message. 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. And the extent of their repentance is visceral. Humans and animals all put on sackcloth. They all fast. They all cry out before the Lord. And finally, they are heard by God. He seems to change his mind. But it's the last chapter of Jonah, I think, that is perhaps the most puzzling, but also the most meaningful. Rather than being delighted that his message has worked, that Nineveh is saved, he's angry at God. Angry at him for acting according to his nature and relenting from punishment. For saving a people who in his eyes did not deserve it. So God tries to teach Jonah a lesson. I feel like he goes about it in a bit of a roundabout way, but who am I <laughs> to question God? So Jonah travels east of the city and sits down, grumbling in self-pity, in frustration, and God takes pity on him. He grows a bush that gives him shade and takes away his discomfort. But the next day, he also sends a worm to eat away at the bush so that Jonah is exposed to the blazing sun and the fierce east wind. It's basically like British people in 25 degree heat. He's in despair. He's at the end of his rope. He's hoping for some respite, but no amount of SPF is going to help him. But what's the moral of this story? What does this elaborate ruse even mean? Well, Jonah is angry about this bush, something he didn't even create and lasted less than three days. And so God asks him, and should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals. And that is how the book ends, with a baffling interaction between God and Jonah, a final unanswered question lacking a conclusion. What are we supposed to make of this rebellious prophet and a God who changes his mind? What does any of this mean? So why don't we go back to Jonah's response to God's decision to stay his hand and change his mind, not punishing the people of Nineveh. We read that to Jonah, this seemed very wrong and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. So I said at the beginning that the key to unlocking this passage would be understanding Jonah's hesitation to go to Nineveh. 
and his revelation of God's character to God himself seems to go some way to answering that question. Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh because he didn't want Nineveh to be saved. He knew that if he preached a message of repentance, those evil people would repent. And if they repented, then God would forgive. And God would forgive because he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. And Jonah's not wrong. This is who God is. This is the God we serve. We know that because this isn't the only time such descriptions of God appear in scripture. Psalm 103 says, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. Nehemiah 9 says, you are a forgiving God, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. You're beginning to get the idea. Exodus 34 reminds the Israelites God himself reminds the Israelites that he is the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God. So Jonah is reciting to God his own steadfast knowledge of who God is. A God of grace, love and compassion, whose love proceeds to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. But here's the sticking point. He can't handle it. He can't handle the thought of a God who is so merciful that his forgiveness extends even to those as evil as the Ninevites. For that's what the Israelites thought the Ninevites were. Nineveh was a powerful city within the Assyrian Empire, an empire who captured the Israelites, who deported them from their homeland. We read that in 2 Kings 17. So no wonder Jonah wasn't willing to preach a message to that city, lest they turn and repent. But what does a disgruntled prophet's gripe with the Ninevites have to do with us today? Well, I think these are where the two questions I mentioned at the beginning come into play. The first, can we handle God's love? So Jonah couldn't handle the fact that God's love was big enough to extend to his own evil enemies. And some commentators have read the story of Jonah as an account which aims to show that God's love extends beyond the chosen Israelite people. It barges through the human obstacles of pride and prejudice by showing that delighting in God's love might mean willing to accept that God will love those who we don't like. And learning from Jonah, can we handle the fact that God's love is too big to fit into our own gripes, our own preferences? We might not hear the audible voice of God telling us to preach his gospel to an evil nation. But the same principle applies in our daily lives as followers of Christ. Have there been times when we felt led to share the gospel or to reach out to another in love? but our assumptions become obstacles to our actions? Do we sometimes look at our neighbor's lifestyle or how they've hurt us and we think they're too far gone to be saved by God, too far away to hear God's call? Or even this person has hurt me so much, I don't think I would want to share the gospel with them anyway. And thinking this doesn't make us bad or evil people. It just makes us people. And as people, sometimes we can't understand the extent of God's love. For Jonah, just judgment would have been to see Nineveh destroyed. And maybe that's why we read at the beginning of chapter 4 that Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to this city. So even though God's already relenting, is he maybe hoping in his heart of hearts that Nineveh might still just get their just desserts? But God's abundant most mercy blows out of the water his confining notions of judgment. But where does that leave us? Are we doomed to a life of wrestling with God, grappling and unable to accept his expansive mercy. Or maybe you're thinking that this doesn't sound very much like you at all. You're thinking, I'm not perfect, but 
I think I love my enemies enough to want them to turn, repent, and know Jesus. Even if we don't like them very much, surely we want them to know God's love. A challenge to that assumption came to me um, when a friend was relating a talk that he had heard Nabil Qureshi give. I don't know if you've heard of Nabil Qureshi. He was an ardent Christian apologist who dedicated his life to telling people about God's love. He had been Muslim, but after consistent conversation with a friend of his who was Christian, he became convinced of the truth of the Christian faith and he decided to give his life to Jesus. Sadly, he was diagnosed with stomach cancer and he passed away in 2017, but he left an incredible legacy behind. And in a talk about Islam and Christianity, he related to how prior to his conversion, when he was in conversations with Christians, he would take every opportunity to turn it around to tell them why Christianity was wrong. He would challenge their core principles and at times he would find their answers lacking. But he would still have respect for people who preached the gospel to him. In his mind, if the gospel was to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and to believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then for him there were only two reasons why a Christian would not preach the gospel. Either they didn't believe it or they didn't care about him missing out on eternal salvation. And that was it. When it was put to me like that, something clicked. I couldn't say I didn't believe it because I did. So why have I run like Jonah so often from telling others of this blatant good news? Perhaps it was because I didn't love my neighbor enough or enemy to care about their eternal standing with God. It was because I couldn't handle God's love and I couldn't imitate it. That brings me to my second question. Can we imitate God's love. Jonah didn't love his enemies enough to willingly let the mercy of God work in their lives. He cared more about a plant that he had no control over than the eternal destiny of his fellow human. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to put a burden on our lives to say that it is up to us whether people believe or not. Ultimately, God is the one who saves. But perhaps one of the key ways we can show God's love and practice handling it is by living lives and speaking words that point to the good news of Jesus' death and resurrection. By choosing not to run away from Tarshish, run away to Tarshish, but to long for the salvation of even our greatest enemies. And if you haven't heard the gospel before, this is it in a nutshell. That God created a good world, and he created humans good too. But with our free will, we chose to rebel and sin and turn away from God. Our sin creates a barrier between us and God. And by turning away from the source of all life, we incur the penalty of death. But God in his goodness couldn't leave us to die. So in Jesus, he came to die on the cross. And when we trust in him, we can be restored to relationship with God. And he rose again to show that death no longer has power over us, that one day we also will rise again. That's the gospel. But let's search our hearts to understand where our prejudices and preferences might be hindering our own call to Nineveh. Paul's words in Romans 10 are convicting on this point. He writes, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? Jonah not only teaches us that running away from God is never possible, but asks, why are we running in the first place? Do we love our enemies enough to preach the gospel to them? Or do we secretly discount people from the gospel because we are selfish and judging? Are we content to keep this good news to ourselves? Again, if we look at the New Testament, this idea of love as the driving force of our commission crops up again and again 
In 2 Corinthians, Paul is talking about the trouble that he has gone through to preach Jesus to Gentiles. He says, besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin and I do not inwardly burn? That question, I think, is a challenge to us. Are we so committed to our God and the salvation he has given us that our hearts inwardly burn for those who don't know him? Or are we too blinded by our own prejudices or sense of justice or simple lack of love to obey his call to tell people to repent? Jonah's reluctance to preach to Ninevites many hundred years ago may ask us, whether we are preaching to the Ninevites of our own age. And so we all, like Jonah, have had a word from the Lord. And that word from the Lord might not look like an audible voice booming out of the sky, telling us to make the journey to Nineveh. But it is a word that we are his witnesses in this world. It is a word that we are ambassadors of Christ, that we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. And it is the word that by our love, the world will know that we are his disciples. And we can have a choice. We can either run from that word, boarding a ship to Tarshish and allowing our fear of God's mercy and lack of our own love to hinder our footsteps. Or we can say yes to God's big love. We can make that journey into Nineveh and tell even our enemies of how much God loves them. Like Jonah, we become obsessed and preoccupied by trivial things in our lives. It was a transient bush that dictated Jonah's emotions, but for us, it might be something else. And if we can allow those things to determine whether we are in despair or happy, can we not see how God's preoccupation with us, his very creation, might be bigger than we could ever imagine? big enough to ignite a love in his heart that drove him to the cross? And can we imitate that love? I think by God's grace alone, we can. It says in Psalm 103 that as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. And funnily enough, Jonah running to Tarshish is him running about as far east as he possibly can from the city of Nineveh. But no matter how far he ran, he could not outrun God's forgiveness. And neither can we. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that when it comes to being adopted into your family, there are no favorites. We are all sons and daughters of the Most High heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the power of your word. I pray that you would ignite in our hearts a passion for it, for your gospel that would lead us to preach it even to our enemies. And I pray that you would make us aware today of your great mercy that triumphs over human judgment, prejudices, preferences. That means everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.